Okay, everybody, uh, end of the week, five o'clock Friday countdown here, fun Friday. We have a great guest and uh, this is the Carillon Community Conversation. And we try to bring a divergent population to the show so we can drop the knowledge on you. And I have to tell you, we have a guest today that I don't think anybody in the world has her background. Uh, it's tough enough for me to say her name. I'm sorry I, if I mangle it, but it's Leticia uh, Hua. Uh, yeah, you right? got it. Yes. Oh, woo All right, I'm one for one. Okay, so basically, Leticia is an activist and a lawyer. She's licensed in New York and the federal court. Uh, this is the, the uh, hooch. She was the Miss Maricopa County of 2019 and used the year of her service to advocate for criminal justice reform. Uh, she chaired a subcommittee at the Arizona House of Representatives to highlight distinct issues facing incarcerated women. And she recently joined the executive board of the AAPI, which is the uh, Asian American Pacific Islander Caucus of the Democratic Party. And actually in District 23, there's about 5,000, uh, actually rivaling about the same number as uh, Latinx. So welcome to the show, Leticia. Thank you. And I live in LD23, and I'm so excited for your campaign and to support you as well. Oh, boy. Uh, so uh, basically, we're, we're talking, I can. I don't have to put the disclaimer that this isn't so much a, a, a platform for you to just talk and not endorse my candidacy. You actually support me, which yeah. is nice. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I, I just really touched a little bit on your background. But uh, just talking to you it is really complex. So I want to break it down to you were born in France. Yes, I was born in Paris. Paris. Take it from there because it gets crazy. Well, um, yeah, so I was born in, in Paris. Um, my parents are both immigrants. My father, who recently passed away, um, was from China. My mom's from Taiwan. So that's very politically tense and interesting there. Um, but I stayed in Paris until I was eight years old. So I grew up speaking Mandarin, um, went to school in France and started learning fr French from scratch. By the time I finally got a hang of French, my mom moved us um, to Scottsdale, Arizona. And then I had to learn English from scratch again because I did not speak a word of English um, when I arrived to the United States. Um, it took my family about 10 years uh, to become lawful um, US citizens, which was really exciting. Um, I then graduated from high school here. I went on to study law in Scotland at the University of Edinburgh. Um, then did an LLM at Georgetown Law. Then I thought I was gonna practice in New York. So I sat for the bar in New York and passed. Um, and now I'm trying to get licensed in Arizona. So that's me. Fantastic. And uh, by trying to get licensed in Arizona, you're forced to do something a little bit different, right? Right. So um, I had originally asked the Arizona Supreme Court to um, grant my petition to be able to sit for the bar here. Um, but my petition got denied yesterday. So I am going back to law school for an accelerated JD at ASU and going to law school for the third time. So hurrah. <laughs> well, uh, it's just amazing. Uh, the path you've taken. I don't know too many people that could stay on that path and succeed as you have. I won't ask you your age, but you look very young. And from what you've done so far in life, uh, you've lived a full lifetime already. My goodness, you're on your second. So uh, let's let's get into this thing here we call uh, the uh, community conversation. Anybody out there watching on Facebook, please put in a question in the comment area. Uh, started off with the question mark, kind of like in Spanish, but not upside down. So people can still have a conversation amongst themselves in that stream. And we can then pull out those questions so that Andy, our campaign manager here, can then put them into the Zoom. And by the magic of my internet that is still working at the moment, we'll try to get you the answers. Okay, 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 okay. So this is Fun Friday. Um, I, I am going to end this broadcast with a series of questions to try to stump you. I will actually give you a choice from which international spot you'd like those questions to come from. So tune in for that a little bit later. But right now, I, I want to talk about your passion, which is really uh, sentencing reform and prison and really women's health and incarceration, how those collide. My opponent in the primary uh, or in the general election, if he gets through the primary, Jay Lawrence is actually one of the chairs, I think is vice chair of the, of the Judiciary Committee. And he actually was on the John Oliver show 
um, as playing himself from an actual hearing, talking about how he thought periods were yucky. And he was so upset that he had to be talking about it in his committee. And I'm like, okay, perhaps he doesn't belong there. But can you talk a little bit about women's issues and how it works in prisons and everything? Because they were allowed three pads or something like that. And it was just crazy. Right. So I have had um, the privilege to visit some of the those women at Perryville who have told me very heartbreaking stories about their lives in general, the health conditions and the struggle that they experience um, coming out of prisons. And I think that with feminine products, that is a kind of this, you know, a basic health needs for women. And unfortunately, a lot of people um, might think that that is yucky, um, like your opponent. And I truly don't believe that he should be on that committee um, because those things are an essential um, healthcare right for women. It's about women's dignity and no women should have to sit um, in prisons or in jails with no feminine products um, bleeding all over themselves. Um, I think that's just kind of the standard for a civilized society that we need to be building. But apart from that, I don't think that our prison system is doing a good job as uh, honoring human dignity and human rights, which is why criminal justice reform is something that I'm very passionate about. Yeah, so, so that's why I hope you win, so you can change change some of these things. Well, well, I want to go to you right now and say, what would you change? What are some of the things that are top on your list here in Arizona? I have a few, but I'd like to hear from you. So. There are several things I would do. Um, I know that in terms of sentencing, uh, we incarcerate people uh, longer than the national average in Arizona. And I think that that's uh, a bad use of taxpayer money, um, especially when that money could be going to education. And that secondly, a lot of the people I have met in Perryville, I don't think they should be in prison in the first place. Um, those are people who are there because of low level crimes or drug addiction or mental health issues or poverty. And we need to be to stop criminal these things as a society. Um, before I got into criminal justice reform, I was under the impression that only bad people went to prison because um, that's kind of how you, you grow up thinking about this issue. But the more I learned, the more I realized that these people, a lot of these people are very everyday, your average women, um, and they are some of the most inspiring women I have ever met. And it breaks my heart that they are there. Um, and that, and I, I'm advocating also for for the state to recognize that women have very distinct needs and therefore we must have a different approach when we come up with criminal justice uh, policies that impact women. Yeah, uh, do you have um, any stories from your time working over at Perryville and trying to make a difference that have really like kind of stuck with you and made an impression? Because you kind of glossed over how there's some people serving time for really insignificant things, but could you? I have met women who uh, war victims of domestic violence um, who have come from very, very troubled families um, and women who, so the majority of them are mothers, um, the, the women I have met, and most of them don't even know how to get their kids back. So when they lose um, parental rights uh, after they are released, they are completely kind of helpless as to what um, their legal rights are. And for me, um, I think family unity should be something that's honored um, and that these that justice for these women shouldn't be unbearably expensive, which is the case. Um, and one of the ideas I have for the future would be to ideally create a, um, a legal clinic to help these women gain regain cu uh, custody of their kids. Um, I think in general, uh, during the, the time that I am there with them, a lot of a lot of the women just share with me just really heartbreaking stories in general. Um, and some of them have hugged me at the end, telling me how impactful and meaningful it is to have someone just listen to their stories. Um, and while I did share a subcommittee at the house, we did we surveyed over 200 women. Um, and it's heart also heartbreaking to see the numbers of women who are subjected to verbal abuse from correctional officers. And I think that's something that will impact them for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Um, speaking of abuse, uh, is sexual abuse prevalent in the women's the prison system? Yes, a good number of them um, have reported sexual abuse um, or that they, um, well, you know, in, I say voluntarily in quotes, um, 
engage in sexual relations with the correctional officers in order to gain certain favors. And um, I think it's this whole system, not only it's about changing the laws, but it's about changing the culture of what goes on inside the prisons. Um, I, I think right now it's, we're focused so much on punishment, but people come out worse uh, from you know when they're released from prisons than when they go in and that's a huge issue for us because it leads us to really question why we have those prisons in the first place if we're going to make people worse um, coming out. I, I think you're absolutely right and there's a lot of society I think that uh, when you touched upon it in the very beginning you talked about how people view those in prison as they've all done something heinous right something horrible that deserves them to be there but that's not always the case. And sometimes it's kind of like the schooling that they get in prison, I imagine, right? This is the way they learn how to survive because Maslow's hierarchy does not stop. You have to survive. And so they're not learning skills. They're not really coming out with anything that would push them forward in society other than what they've learned and trying to survive. And, and the, the recidivism rate is just through the roof. Am I right? right. Yes. Yeah, so I think almost half of the women end up going back to prisons or half of the people, um, including men. And um, when it comes to jobs, I know that a lot of the jobs available disadvantage women. So for example, um, a lot of people go into construction, that's a job that's available, but the reality is that uh, women are often not hired for those jobs because these companies prefer men. It's not to say that women can't succeed in construction, but it's just, they're just disadvantaged. So that's one of the reasons why I think a gendered approach or recognizing that men and women have distinct needs when, while incarcerated would really help um, in, a, in trying to resolve those issues. Yeah. And, and we're also a state that requires 85% of a sentence to be served. Yes. While, uh, you know, also giving money to private prisons to incarcerate people and keep them incarcerated. It's a vicious cycle. And yeah. I, I'm afraid that people don't see the long-term benefits of rehabilitation because we have a society here in Arizona that the lawmakers are kind of looking at retribution and a pound of flesh. Yes. Yes, I definitely think there's this myth that um, being so called tough on crime is what is going to help. And I know that that phrase sounds really good, but then in, in reality, it's like, okay, so you punish someone, you send someone to prison for 10 years for a low level crime and, that, and then what? You're using taxpayers' money for all these 10 years and then they're either the same person when they're released or they're not being helped in society. And how is that beneficial to us? So. Yeah, so, so as, a, as a teacher, right, we would always talk about positive reinforcement to get the um, behaviors you desire. Mm -hmm. When a person uh, goes to prison, there is no positive reinforcement I see that really would change a behavior. If anything, there's negative reinforcement that continues them on that path because that's the attention that they're getting. Um, it's really quite interesting and, and fascinating and I, and I appreciate your advocacy. Are you gonna continue somewhere in this vein like, so I know you're going to graduate from ASU and go sell devils. Oh, yes, you will. Come on. You've, you've done everything so far. That's going to be a piece of cake. Uh, so so what, what are your future? What are your future plans? How do you plan on using your law degree here in, in Arizona? So, so many different things have happened in the midst of the, the quarantine situation. Um, so I am joining my really good mentor, Natalie Siegel, um, and working on some of her cases under her supervision and also her partner, Dan Belliser, who practices immigration law in federal courts. Um, so I definitely want to explore criminal defense and immigration, um, but then law school is also an opportunity for me to explore other areas other areas of law that I'm interested in. Um, but ultimately, I want to live a life committed to public service. I think criminal justice reform is an issue that I will always be working on for the rest of my life until I think that our system is more just. And I'm not even saying 100% the justice that I idealize and envision. I'm, I'm just saying slightly more just than the, the system that we have now. Baby steps, but just Baby steps, steps in the right direction. Let us get yeah. to the finish line. Um, but then in recent weeks, I have also joined the board of the AAPI caucus and I have um, worked as, as an organizer and that's been some of the most like transformative experience of my life. And I realized that 
there are so many um, AAPI voters who have never been touched by a campaign before. So that's another one of my projects coming up is trying to mobilize voter turnout for our Asian American voters. And maybe that that's something awesome. I could work with you on in, in your campaign in our district. So look yeah, at yeah. that. You've got a spot in this campaign for sure. We'll pay you in uh, unicorns. I heard that you like stuffed unicorns. Oh, okay. So this is Penelope. Um, oh my goodness. Look, folks out there, ask your questions, all right? Because I had no idea that that unicorn was at the foot of her uh, seat right there. Yes, she's always there. Oh my goodness. Um, but Eric, I want to hear about your campaign and your journey. And I oh, just... look at that. We have a question coming in from Will Knight. It's a long one. We'll get to your question in a moment, Latish. Uh, let me see here. A long one from Will Knight. Okay. Since your efforts last year at the Department of Corrections has agreed to guarantee women in prison 36 pads per month with other women's hygiene products available for purchase, that said, they're limited to two at a time and they have to ask the CEO, usually a male, whenever they need more. Is this sufficient? What more should we do to provide adequate health care and hygiene to treat incarcerated women with human dignity? First of all, I don't know if this sounds like a crazy idea, because for me as a woman, this sounds like a perfectly reasonable, reasonable idea, but I don't know how many um, feminine hygiene products I would need per cycle. It just really depends. And because of that, I think women should be entitled to as many tampons and pads and hygiene products that they need. And it's similarly with toilet paper, that should also be the case because I have heard stories from women, especially older women who need to use more toilet paper and they don't have any anymore. And then the correctional officers are like, well, that's too bad for you, suck it up. And so when it, coming back to human dignity, why do we need to treat people this way? Um, so I would say that they deserve an unlimited amount of feminine hygiene products. And if we can't even get there, a much more reasonable amount, which is way greater than the uh, amount that they are entitled to now. Does that sound reasonable? Because I feel like as a woman, this is something that is so standard to think about. And I don't know why we haven't implemented that. It's absolutely reasonable. I mean, what else? I, here's, here's, you know, as this conversation's going on, I'm thinking, why is there a problem with feminine hygiene products? Are they using them to break out of prison? I mean, are they sawing the bars on their jail cells with these things? What is the problem here? They're not eating them for snacks to, or anything. I mean, <laughs> um, I haven't done that before, but yeah, no, it's just, I, I just don't get it. Sometimes. Uh, so I have a story for you, Leticia. I, I, here, here's the thing. Sometimes people do things that other people before them have done without knowing why. So there, there's a story about the person who uh, makes the baked potatoes and says, whoa, 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 make, when you make the baked potato, you got to cut off each of the ends. That way the potato doesn't explode. This is what I hear. The potato doesn't explode. You put it in there and it cooks great. That's the way you cook a baked potato. Well, then the, the person says, uh, you know, where did you hear that from? Your mom. You know, she says, my mom. So uh, the, the guy will say, okay, uh, let me talk to your mom about that. Hey mom, you know, your daughter says that she cooks the baked potato this way by cutting off the ends. Why is that pop? I don't know, that's the way I learned about it from my mom. So it goes over there, hey grandma, why do you cut? Well, when we were that age, we had uh, very small ovens and we had these big potatoes. And in order for us to fit the potatoes in the oven, we had to cut off the ends so that it would get in there. I would never cut off the ends, but we had to cook the potatoes. So meanwhile, people are like, oh, right? So. People have always done the same thing, even though it does to make sense. Here's my point, Leticia. We have to do better. We have to always question. We have to continually improve. We can't just do something one day and say, ah, that's good for the rest of existence. I absolutely agree. Um, with feminine hygiene products, though, I do have another point I would like to make is that I think periods are very stigmatized. I, I don't know if you if you would feel that way about it. Um, so my own experience in an office I won't mention by name, but I had asked whether my healthcare covers birth control and you know some of the women's medical procedures, and I was told that that's an extremely inappropriate thing to say in an office. And then it got me thinking: if I am treated like that as a professional, why do we think that the most marginalized women in Perryville would get better treatment. And I think that 
in many ways, even though I'm not directly impacted um, by the prison system, many of my life experiences do relate um, to the women in Perryville. And I, I don't really see them as, you know, inmates or, or quote unquote prisoners. I, I really do think of them in a way as my sisters. And until they are free and they have the human dignity and justice that they deserve, I don't feel free. I don't feel that I'm living in a just system. And that's why I really do want to fight for them. And um, I, I think about them all the time. I have had days where I drive to Perryville um, with tears in my eyes, thinking that these women are so they're so hopeful about being released and they want to have a better life. Um, and they're really, really motivated, but because we, they don't get enough help and they're released with $50 in their pockets, so many of them end up coming back. And it's, it's something that weighs heavily in my heart for sure. Yeah, well, good. Uh, we need more people like you, you know, doing well by the society. Um, if you have questions for Leticia, just go ahead and type them into the bar uh, feel free to put in some comments there as well. I I do have to get get around to this because it's it's fascinating. First of all, when, how old were you when you came over here from France? I was eight years old. Eight years old. Wow. Yeah. So I know that you sh you said you don't want to ask me um, for my age, but I am twenty six. So I turned twenty six in March. Wow, you're just a baby. I know. I I love being a baby. It's my favorite thing to do. Yeah, I, I act like a baby, so you know. I wake up in the middle of the night crying. Uh, oh, that's really depressing. I'm just kidding. Me too. Um, you know, the person who says, I sleep like a baby. I wake up every two hours crying and feeding. So, you know, that's oh, kind of my life. You're getting fed, I don't know. Now, you wanted to ask me a question, so go ahead. I forgot. Um, okay, then I'll ask you a question. Um, okay. tell, me, tell me about your journey to become Miss Maricopa County. Oh. Okay. Uh, so when I was 14, I had a friend ask me if I would compete in a pageant with her. And I said, no way, that's completely stupid and sexist. I'm not doing that. And I ended up going with her for moral support and winning my state title in my age category. Um, and ever since I had a, a coach who was a former um, contestant in the Miss USA pageant train me. And I realized that people think of pageantry as women lining up in a row and they pick the prettiest one and that's totally not the case anymore. So there is um, such a heavy emphasis on talent, on interviewing. Um, I think it was during my preparation for pageant interviews, it's when I've engaged with all of the um, current events issues and I'm much more informed then when I was competing probably than now, um, but it really it, and it really trained me to be a public advocate. So I, I had a committee that ran my life um, and it's, it was kind of amazing. It was probably, yeah, it's probably the most fulfilling time of my life. Wow, uh, and what year was that? So um, I have gotten several titles, but when I was Miss Maricopa County, that was in 2019. Yeah, and then you used that, that year to actually speak on behalf of prison reform, right? Yes, I partnered with um, several of the criminal justice organizations in the state. I partnered with Forward and their communications team uh, to talk about this issue to people who have never really engaged with criminal justice reform. And I think that's how you change the hearts and mind of the people. It's to reach out to people who don't know about this. So I think public education is really important, as you would know, because you're a teacher. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I do believe that. I'm just, I'm just floored. You're 26 years old and you've done so much in your life. And uh, my goodness, uh, for the people out there, this is Leticia, uh, Leticia. Yeah. Joshua Hua. Okay. Yeah, I told you so, you could call me Lay, but you're not, you're not jumping on that train. So. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, Lay, uh, we have quite a few questions that are coming in. Oh, no. uh, what happens to pregnant women in custody? Do they get prenatal care? Do they get to spend time with their children before going back? Um, so we have asked these questions in our survey. And if you Google Jimmy Jenkins um, and subcommittee on women's issues, you can see our presentation slides with all of the data. Um, but I know that that young children are no longer allowed to sit on their mother's lap. Um, and I know that visitation has changed and has become way stricter than it was before, which is um, 
unfortunate because a lot of the times those mothers are um, motivated to change their lives around because they want to see their kids because they want to be responsible parent and I think that connection to their kids is so important um, I think women do receive some type of prenatal care now but I don't think that it's adequate and from what I remember it, it is very limited um, I know one of my my closest friends now who um, who knew a lot of women at Prairieville she was saying she saw women give birth and right after they, they took her baby away and she saw her walk across the yard carrying everything by herself um, forced to push her own wheelchair you know down the down the yard and that's kind of the typical treatment for for women there um, so coming back to the dignity issue I, I think that's that is very unfortunate um, and then in the past of course we've had a history of shackling women during pregnancy um, and now I think we still do it uh, to in certain medical visits. And even though a lot of that has been banned, it's still uh, occurring based on the stories I hear. Not to depress anyone. Okay, here's another good question um, with a little pre, pre uh, uh, story here. We're all affected by Perryville as long as they don't have educational opportunities, places to live and real work to do upon leaving prison. Uh, how do we change this? What is your advice for me when I get elected? I think it's important to partner with businesses and be able to open up those doors to those opportunities. And, um, I have spoken to some business owners, um, a lot of CEOs who still are under the impression that you know every anyone with a background is quote unquote bad. And until we change that perception, I think it will be very difficult for businesses to get on board. So it goes back to the public education for me. Um, but Partnering with businesses is, is important. And my good friend and mentor, Franz Beasley, who runs Arizona Common Ground, that's his entire nonprofit, is connecting people who are coming out of prisons with job opportunities. Um, but of course, job opportunities might be limited. And um, it's I don't think giving someone a minimum wage job for the rest of their lives is, is the way to go. It's about expanding those opportunities and uh, maybe erasing that, those criminal backgrounds after a certain period of time. Um, so people can go on to to live their lives and achieve more. Positive reinforcement. If you give people a light at the end of the tunnel, chances are they might get there, right? Yes. I mean, if we if we, I mean, we sometimes we espouse words, right? And we say, oh, anybody can change, you know, um, you know, forgive and forget. We have all these different phrases that we use, and especially in religion. And yet it seems kind of juxtaposed where the, there are the same people that want to be like, uh-uh, lock them up, throw away the key. And, you know, you do the crime, do the time. It's, it's expensive. It's uh, immoral. I, I think you have to give people an opportunity to exceed your expectations and put them on that path. It just makes, even if it's just fiscal sense. Yes. Um, I have something else I wanted to mention, but I don't know if it's getting too heavy and depressing. Um, so you know how there's this victim versus kind of prison reform divide? Do you know what I'm saying? So there are people who are um, call themselves like victims advocates who are usually very anti criminal justice reform because they be they might believe that that's not beneficial to those victims. Um, right, the one that wanted the eye for the eye and the whole face for a face and kind of Right, or they, they feel that by um, wanting any sort of, of justice reform that we're doing disservice to, to victims and that we're not adequately protecting victims. Okay. So, okay, I'll tell you a story. How much time do we have? Uh, you got, we're, we're Friday, so we're kind of open. We're gonna get into the end, but you have the time, young lady. Okay, so years ago, I was a victim of a crime. So, oh my gosh, my dog wants to go out. Okay, sorry, five minutes and I have to let my dog, dog out and then we come back. So <laughs> years ago, I was a victim of a crime. So I was sexually assaulted. And I mentioned this, not to highlight this, the, the experience, but to say that I didn't file a police report for two years because I had so much going on in, in my mind when I made that decision because I was thinking, well, um, do I want that person to end up in prison? What if I ruin his life? And and at the time, I didn't want that person to end up in prison. I wanted that person to never do that to another woman again. But because there are no other options, um, I waited for, for, I think, over two years before I submitted a police report. And my... Um, 
my point is if we had other options and if we were to focus more on rehabilitation, I believe that women who are victims of domestic violence or um, other types of, of, of violence would be more likely to speak up about these issues. Um, Cause I know that some women, for example, if they're victims of domestic violence, they don't want their family to be broken apart. They want their significant others to be rehabilitated um, and to stop the cycle of abuse, um, but they don't want their family member and loved one to be incarcerated. So my two cents is that advocating for victims and advocating for criminal justice reform, they're, they're not separate things, especially when women at Perryville are often vi uh, victims of crimes themselves. So that's one thing I did want to highlight to our lawmakers um, and to bridge that gap. Hopefully that's not too dark and depressing. Not at all. Uh, you're here as our guest and whatever you want to talk about, Lei, is what we talk about. Uh, thank you for sharing. I'm sorry that you went through that. Thank you. Um, uh, we're going to segue into a game. Is that all right? Because <laughs> that um, dog's got to pee. <laughs> yeah, well, here, let me take my computer with me. So my dog is going to pee and then my he's going to bark and my neighbors are going to threaten to sue me again because that's what they do. Yeah, because, okay, watch this. Oh, no, now he's gonna be quiet. Okay, well, um, so Eric, what, do you have stuffed animals? Uh, no, no, I don't. Okay. But my kid has a bunch of stuffed animals. It's really funny. Uh, he collected tons of them when he was a young youngster and uh, being a teacher and my wife is a teacher, I always would work in a Title I school and we would have the need to collect uh, items for families. And so I would always be like, okay, now you're 13. Can I take these stuffed animals and repurpose them? And he would say no. And they, he never, they're all under his bed. I mean, he's got like hundreds of them. So yeah, that's my, you want to tell me about that thing again? Sorry, what? That, that thing, what's his name? Um, well, first of all, it's her and her name is Penelope. So she's pink. Her sister's name is Charlotte, who is white. So yeah. Um, anyway, do you want to talk about your ca your campaign for a bit? You want to let that doggy? I don't want you to get sued. You're not you're not serving. Uh, you're not uh, passing the Arizona bar just yet. Picasso. He does this. So. Um, when I'm alone, he will be very quiet. The moment I'm on the phone for any reason, he's going to start barking. Can you come back, please? We're it on Facebook Live for class. Please don't embarrass me. No, it's not happening. Don't worry. Okay. Hey, look, uh, my campaign is, is just groovy, all right? We are uh, going to win. Uh, it's really exciting. And here, here's the most exciting part. We are in a very low part of, I think, history as a nation whether it's what's going on with racism or, 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 or backwards thinking with, I believe, you know, at the very top and a bunch of division going on. But then we've had this COVID-19 and I've seen so many great acts of kindness. And I get the feeling that people are back to the very simple things in life, which is just breathing, laughing, having emotions, you know, reconnecting, almost just waiting for the time where they can have that socialization. And I think along with that, we have a society that's just ready to put this partisanship aside and to really focus on making a better future for our loved ones. And I think I'm the right candidate at the right time in the right environment and I feel like we are going to be able to work to get a plan for like, where do we want Arizona to be in 20 years? Arizona is just a beautiful state with wonderful people. We just have elected some really poor statesmen. And I don't use the words, I shouldn't use the words. We have elected some really poor people. And uh, who knows, maybe I'm just uh, Pollyanna in the sense that I have been through enough in my life that this isn't going to define me, I'm doing this as a public service and, and, and it's not for the money, it's not to get reelected, it's to get things done. So uh, I'm excited, I'm jazzed. If anybody wants to help out with the campaign, they go to curlin23.com, it's K-U-R-L-A-N-23.com. You might actually get to work with Lay and uh, bring out the Asian population. Anyway, I got some questions for you, okay? Okay. 
All right, so you are a world traveler. You're from France. You've spent some time in Scotland. I am going to give you a choice. I'm all about the food. Do you want to take food from France or do you want to take food from Scotland? Oh, I love French food, so let's go with that. Okay, I'm going to take it a little bit further and say these are things that have the word French before them. Most of them are food. Okay? You ready? Mm hmm Okay. There are no prizes here. This oh. is just for you. No, well, this is just for bragging rights. Okay, okay. so here we go. Uh, this you would have at breakfast time with some syrup on it. French toast. Very nice. Uh, some people would say this is the perfect accompaniment to a burger. French fries. Excellent. Um, in the Midwest, they love this on top of their salad. Um. People put this on their salad? Yeah, it's like orange. It's, it's my, my, uh, my father-in-law loves it in Illinois. Sometimes it's called Catalina. I actually have no idea. Okay, it's French dressing. French dressing. Yeah, That's it's French? French? Yeah, I thought French. that was like, okay, all right, fine. Well, it's like a neon red, orange kind of thing. I've never all had right. that before. This was actually my favorite flavor introduced by Baskin and Robbins a long, long time ago when I was a little kid. I'd like a, a double dip of this. I don't eat at Baskin Robbins either. Do you like ice cream, young lady? I'm lactose intolerant. More than, more, more than we need to know, but I will eat your scoop. It's French vanilla. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm getting the hang that I'm really bad at this. No, no, no. You started off like a gang of fire. You just became bad. Okay. Um, women sometimes do this to their hair. I have a friend who runs and wants to put her hair in this kind of thing so it doesn't uh, get in her face. A French twist? I will accept French twist because that is okay with hair. A French braid. We were looking for French braid. Let's give her a point on the board, okay? Okay. Um, here we I'm go. Uh, you can it back again. No, you, you are. Okay. Musical instrument, part of the brass department. Oh, French horn. Nice. See, that's, a, that's the proper amount of wait time. That's my teacher in me. I could have given you that answer right away, but then you wouldn't have gotten it yourself. Okay, last question. Um, some people make their coffee this way in the morning. French press? Yeah, very good. Hey. Do I get a sticker? You, you uh, get a scratch and snip. Well, I'll tell you what, when I'm elected and we pass a law that says everybody who votes gets a choice of sticker, whether it's the one with the flag that says I voted or a piece of apple pie on a sticker that's a scratch and sniff. You don't even have a campaign sticker? Uh, no. We're going to make one. All right. Okay, it's a deal. Where do Hey, Lay, let's see how well you've learned. Where do people go if they want more information about a campaign that's going to change Arizona? Uh, but Curlin23.com, right? Yeah, see, I told you, you're the smartest kid around. Okay, <laughs> Lay, who, uh, you are wonderful. Uh, I love to see that you succeed, and good luck in your next degree. And tell it, keep us updated on that prison reform, and I'll look for you in office someday. Absolutely. Yay! Okay, I'll see you soon. Okay, now uh, we dance when we... Do a little chair dance to get off. Okay. Okay. Bye. Happy Friday. Happy Friday.